So welcome everybody for the talk Replication Prohibited. This talk covers the subject of 3D printing and the state of physical lock security. Our lovely speaker today is Eric Wistrow. He just flew in from the States four days ago, he told me, and he's still jet lagging. Um, he's a student of computer science engineering in Michigan, USA. And please give him a warm round of applause and enjoy the talk. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks everyone for coming so early on the last day. Um, uh, I'm Eric Wistrow. I'm presenting uh, our research on replication prohibited, uh, which is our research on 3D printed keys and uh, its impact on high security locks. Uh, this is joint work with uh, my co-authors uh, Ben Burgess and J. Alex Hollerman from the University of Michigan. So. Uh, we're talking about pin tumbler locks, which I think is appropriate for this Congress, given that the, the theme is gated communities. Um, so uh, uh, take, take that what you will. But I, I see locks as sort of the, uh, the gatekeepers for the sneaker net of things. Uh, if firewalls are the gatekeepers for the internet of things, then that's what these are for, for this. So um, just a brief overview for those that don't know, uh, pin tumbler locks have uh, you know, these pins in them that uh, only open the lock if the correct key is inserted. If the wrong key is inserted, then uh, the, the cuts on that key only lift the, the pins to different heights, and one or more of the pins will block the inner plug from rotating, and uh, the lock will not open. But if you put in the correct corresponding key, then you will be able to open the lock. Uh, the, uh, the pins will be lined up along the shear line and, and be broken along the shear line, and this allows the inner plug to turn. Now, of course, it's important to, to remember that, that keys, uh, the secret information is encoded in these cuts. If you can ever you know, take a picture or, or observe someone uh, having these, uh, these cuts on a key, then you can figure out how to open the lock that that goes to. And there was an attack in 2008 that sort of generalized this and, and went a bit further and said that you, know, you don't have to just worry about people next to you and, and very close to you that can see your locks. Uh, you have to worry about sometimes people very far away that have telephoto lenses and cameras that can take pictures uh, of high resolution um, from, across, oops, from across entire courtyards uh, where you, know, you can sort of see from, from some roof level uh, there's some keys sitting on a book that's barely visible by the naked eye, uh, but you can actually make out the cuts uh, on this key from this image. Uh, there's some you know, tricks to transforming the image so that you can actually see it straight on rather than at this weird angle, uh, but nonetheless this is possible to do, uh, and they demonstrated this in this work. Of course, there's also bump keys, which is a common attack against pin tumbler locks that have uh, you, you, you cut a key uh, to the lowest level and then uh, put it in the lock, give it a, a sharp tap, and this uh, bounces many of the pins up. And if you turn the key at just the right time, then maybe the plug will rotate uh, as the upper pins clear the shear line just for a, a split moment. And finally, I think. One of the most interesting attacks uh, for pin tumbler locks comes out of master keyed systems, as unique to master keyed systems. Um, and in a master keyed system, uh, you have multiple keys that can open a single lock. So say I have my key that opens my office door at the University of Michigan, uh, and it only opens that one, but the building manager has a key that opens every door in, in the building. And how this is accomplished is there are actually multiple pins, more than two pins in each stack, uh, and, and, e and you have different pins that correspond to each of the different keys. So my low-level change key that opens just my office door can, can have cuts that correspond to the red and the green pins, whereas the master key that opens all the doors has cuts that correspond to uh, just the red pins. And in 2002, Matt Blaze published this, this privilege escalation or this rice amplification attack uh, that's unique to master keyed systems, uh, which I call the blaze attack. This is an attack that allows a, a, an attacker to, that has just a change key, just a low level change key, to query their lock and learn what the master key to the entire system is. And to give you a sense of how this works, uh, I'll walk through this, this illustration. So again, I have my low-level change key that opens just my office door, and it operates these, the red and green pins at the shear line. And so what the attacker does is it takes this key and makes a similar copy to it that has all of the same cuts except for one pin. One pin is different. It raises it to the, to the highest level. Uh, 
And the attacker puts this in the lock and tries to open it and, if, and sees if it opens it. In this case, it wouldn't open the lock because this red pin is, is blocking the plug from rotating. So the attacker removes it, files it down, and tries it again, and continues doing this until the lock opens. And because all of the other pins are still kept at their old position that would normally open the lock, uh, once the attacker uh, is able to open the lock, they have learned what the master cut is for that pin position. So they can repeat this for each, then, iteratively, of the pins in this lock with different blanks and different, uh, different key cuts, ultimately revealing what the master key is to this entire system. So one more thing to note about all of these attacks is that you have to find some piece of metal or some piece of material that can fit into the keyway of this lock. Keyways of locks are designed to be a little bit difficult to get into, both for to, to, to prevent lock picking, make it harder to get tools into it, uh, and also to, to make it a little bit more difficult to, to get blanks that uh, can actually fit in these locks. So for a lot of these attacks, for bumping, for making unauthorized duplications, and for privileged escalation, attackers really want to have key blanks that can fit into these locks. And for most of the locks that that we, uh, we encounter, uh, this is very easy. You can just go to, say, a hardware store um, and, and buy one of these blanks and, and actually get it copied from, from, from the dealer. Um, and there's no control or anything like that uh, that's going on in, in these open key systems. One layer above that, there's duplication prohibited keys where you can still buy them uh, online, things like best keys and so forth. Um, and there are manufacturers that sell them. But you may have a little bit harder time finding locksmiths that will duplicate to them or cut to them. Uh, but nonetheless, it's still possible to find them. They're just more rare. But finally, there is a, a step above duplication prohibited, which is restricted keyways, where the keyway itself is often patented or controlled or somehow uh, specifically and custom designed for each system by the lock manufacturer. And this can be system specific in a way that uh, the lock manufacturer and the locksmith that deploys it have some kind of contract where only that locksmith can buy blanks that fit that particular keyway. And they have some key card that authenticates it to, to buying that. Uh, and so you wouldn't be able to buy these blanks online uh, even if you, you know, knew what they were. Um, to, to further make this more, more difficult for attackers to find these blanks, these key designs are often patented so that if someone actually was able to manufacture some of these keyway, keyways for popular restricted uh, uh, keyways, then they wouldn't be able to legally sell them without infringing on the patent. So if you're an attacker and you want to still get access to these blanks, you have a couple of options at your disposal. You could try to custom manufacture it yourself, right? You could go to a CNC mill and you know, measure out the, the key that you're trying to copy and you know, just drill this down from, from some stock metal or something like that. And that certainly is possible for most keyways, although some keyways try to make this more difficult by having crazy undercuts and things like that that are difficult to replicate on CNC mills. But in general, this is going to cost you know, some amount of money and take a, a, a fair amount of skill to do in practice. There's actually a machine that will do this for you uh, called the Keymax Easy Entry. Um, and this is a, a pretty cool device. You just put in a key that you want to copy. At the top, it has a little probe that comes out and measures different parts of the, of the key's thickness, and then has a, a, a second part that has a CNC mill that cuts this smiley face key blank into whatever key that you put in in the top. Now, this machine is not cheap. Last I checked, I think it's about 7,000 euro. But it's you know, uh, something that could be useful for attackers if they were you know, breaking into banks, I guess. So finally, there's 3D printing. Uh, this is something that's becoming much more consumer available. Uh, I've seen several 3D printers here at, at Congress. Uh, and, 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 and 3D printers are a really sort of a, a fast, you know, innovating thing that's going on and, and rapidly improving. Uh, the state and the, the strength of the materials that they can print. Uh, 3D printing still requires some amount of skill, but the tools there are also improving. That uh, You can find these, these free tools to model things in uh, that, that makes it much easier than, than it used to be. So one question is, if we print keys in plastic or in whatever material, are these printed keys actually strong enough to use in practice? To answer this question, uh, our group performed an experiment on a number of different keyways. We, we uh, 
modeled several different key ways of keys in plastic, in, in uh, acrylic, in nylon, and in, in, in several different materials, including metal. And we took them all and put them into locks and tried to break them off with the most expensive screwdriver that I have ever purchased in my life. Um, it has, a, it has a USB output, and it tells you how many inch-pounds of torque is being applied to the screwdriver. Uh, and the one redeeming quality of this uh, screwdriver, uh, besides its price, is it had a generous return policy. So. <laughs> so we use this tool to measure uh, how, how, how much torque each key could take before it snapped off in the lock. And the results surprised us. Uh, we, we printed keys on a MakerBot using PLA, and this you know, would, would cost pretty cheap for, for each key. Now, the, the MakerBot itself is not eight cents, but it's a, it's a couple thousand dollars. But nonetheless, each individual key that you print off of that is going to be fairly cheap. And to our surprise, this key was strong enough to open most of the applications that you would come across if you were using these keys in practice. So we, we, we rank these four things, uh, opening a door latch, which is just a very sort of light spring at a couple uh, inch pounds of torque, uh, all the way down to a crash bar where you're actually physically pulling in one of those uh, sort of massive crash bars from the outside with just the key. And to our surprise, the PLA was actually able to do most of these. Uh, we mark pass if all of the keys were stronger than the torque it took to open one of these. So all of the, all of the keys that we tested were stronger than, say, the torque it takes to open various padlocks. Uh, we marked it fail if none of them were strong enough to open any of the, the tests of, of opening them. And we marked it may fail if some of them passed and some of them didn't. So we also tested nylon and acrylic. Uh, and these are two different materials, but they had uh, basically the same results, despite being sort of having different failure modes and properties. Nylon is a very stretchy material, and acrylic sort of just snaps off and lock. And uh, despite being more expensive and, and coming from actually a uh, 3D printing service, uh, these were much weaker than the, than the PLA originally. Uh, and these, this probably would not be used in any kind of attack that you would want to do. We tried alumide, which is a slightly stronger plastic that has some sort of aluminum filings mixed into it. And, uh, and this was a little bit better. It's you know, $3 per key, so it's still pretty cheap. Uh, and it's able to open some of the weaker uh, components, but it won't open a crash bar or, or some of the padlocks that we had uh, testing on this. Uh, but alumide also had this, this bad property that it had the very rough surface to it. It almost had a, a sandpaper-like feel to it. Uh, so when you were putting it in and out of a lock, it felt like you were grinding down the brass of the lock. So it, you, might, you might actually damage it ultimately if you use lots of these in, in locks. And then it might also break off. Finally, we tested uh, a couple of metals, uh, several metals actually, stainless steel and brass, uh, and, and bronze as well, but, but it was the same as brass, um, which is something that you can surprisingly print in, in three dimensions with, with these services. You can go to these services and, and give them a CAD model, and they'll ship you that same object printed in whatever metal you want. Um, you can even print it in gold, I guess, if you want to match your Apple watch or something. <laughs> so uh, when we tested this in practice, the metal does cost a little bit more. It's about $10 for the stainless steel, or $30 or so, $25 for the brass uh, of, of that amount of metal in, in, in brass. And this worked flawlessly. This opened everything that, that we had access to. And then some, it was about half as strong as the real blanks that you would buy from, say, a hardware store. Uh, but that's still an order of magnitude stronger than you need to, uh, to open many of these locks in practice. Uh, and as an anecdote, I've actually been using a brass printed uh, key uh, for all of my opening my office door for the last few years and haven't had really any problems with the brass one. Uh, though I will note that the stainless steel one uh, is a little bit rough uh, on the lock, in part because it's actually stronger than the lock, which is made out of brass. So if it's not quite perfectly aligned, you may actually you know, break some of the lock in, in some ways. And I believe all of the locks that had regular stainless steel key use uh, had to be replaced ultimately. So. But what happens when these keys break off in a lock uh, is, is kind of important, and, and how these keys fail. Uh, so I will just you know, note that the things like acrylic or things that are, that are very brittle uh, have these really bad failure cases, that you're turning it, you're turning it, and then all of a sudden it breaks. Um, 
And now you have this piece of plastic stuck in this lock, and it can be very difficult to get out. Uh, if it's PLA, I'll note the best thing to do is to remove the lock from the door, uh, soak it in acetone for about 12 hours, then take some rubbing alcohol, mix it out, put it back in the door, and hope that no one notices your, your door smells like paint stripper anymore, and <laughs> move on with your life. Uh, but things like brass fail much more gracefully. Uh, they, uh, uh, you can actually turn this and feel as it's, as it's bending. Um, and you know, in, in many cases, we were able to turn these brass keys more than about 90 degrees before they failed completely. So it's very obvious that this thing is, is, is breaking and, and not going to open this lock. And you can feel much before you would you know, need to get, get out your broken key extractors um, if this were to snap off in the lock. So how do you make these models in the first place? I mean, have we just punted the, the, the skill to making these models at all? Well, in, in some ways, yes, but the, the, the modeling tools are fairly good. Um, uh, Autodesk Inventor is, is one of the, the software packages we use. Uh, it has a very fast learning curve. It took us about a night to learn and, 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 and print uh, working keys, uh, despite not having any background in, in this kind of um, in this area. Uh, SolidWorks is another tool for this, but those both cost money. Uh, Autodesk has this nice feature that you can actually put uh, Visual Basic scripts in it, so you can just put the key cuts that you want to do, and uh, it will, you know, this program will execute and, and cut the key down to whatever uh, combination you want, which is handy for testing. Um, on the free side of things, there's a 3D modeling tool called OpenSCAD, which is pretty cool. It's entirely uh, sort of scripting based. You write out a program that essentially describes the object that you're trying to build. So you build you know, spheres and, and rectangular solids, and you take differences and unions of these until you get the desired shape that you want. And so this is pretty cool uh, for, for people that are used to programming. Um, but it does take some skill to you know, write out this code in the first place. So, what we did to sort of demonstrate that this is even easier than using those tools is we made an automatically uh, generating 3D model program. Uh, this program takes a single picture of the keyway that you're trying to make a model, uh, a model for and produces that model uh, in, in, in CAD, basically, from this image. Um, uh, you can then take that blank and print it on a 3D printer or ship it off to Shapeways or iMaterialize or whatever your 3D printing service uh, that you want to use is and have it made for you pretty cheap. So how this tool works, first you take an image that can just be taken from a smartphone that's straight on of the lock that has a good view of the keyway itself that's you know, sort of the, the darkest part of this image. And the next thing that the tool does is it tries to threshold this, this image into various uh, uh, places. So it, it tries to thresh, threshold it into a black and white image entirely. Uh, so if things are more than 25 in, in magnitude out of 255, uh, then that pixel is black, uh, and, it, and otherwise it's white. And same for all of the other ones. And so you can see that depending on what threshold value we choose, we get different uh, sort of goodness of, our, uh, uh, of finding the keyway mask out of this image. And 35 seems to be the optimal here. Uh, and once we, we find uh, what the keyway uh, mask is, uh, then we, the, we uh, actually, once we find the optimal threshold, rather, uh, we pull out this keyway by looking for the largest blob in this image. So if we do that for all three of these, we find that, again, in 35, we find the, the best image here, whereas in the other ones, we find either not enough of the keyway or something that's actually not even related to the keyway at all. But how do we determine that 35 value automatically? How do we make sure that that's not you know, image dependent and so forth? Well, one thing that we noticed that, that was true across many different locks and pictures that we took was that if you looked at the area of uh, the largest blob area that you pulled out from an image after thresholding, there was this large jump in area right after you had sort of the optimal uh, keyway mask. And so you can see that here, that if you look in the normalized blob area, it jumps right after 35, um, which is the optimal one for this value. So that's how we determine uh, what, the, what the keyway mask is. We just go and look for that jump and say the value before that is the optimal value. Uh, this allows us to pull out the keyway mask. And we found this to be fairly robust. We tried some more complicated things that I won't get into the detail of uh, for, for computer vision's sake. but. Um, uh, we found that this was, this was surprisingly effective in practice. 
So once you have this, uh, this keyway mask, uh, we have a program that then takes this mask and generates uh, some open SCAD code that will essentially extrude this into a 3D model and places a bow on it that you can then you know, put on a keychain and uh, carry around with you. So finally, you get your 3D model of your key. Uh, and optionally, you can provide cuts to this, this program so that it can cut it down to whatever you know, uh, key that you want to open whatever door that you're trying to do. And if you're trying to do, say, a privilege escalation attack, maybe you make you know, seven copies of this with different cuts on each one. So we released this tool as open source. And um, uh, it's available on, on keysforge.com as a, as a demonstration. You can actually go and uh, try this out. You just upload a picture and optionally provide the key cuts that you want on, on whatever key you have, and it will produce uh, this STL file that you can download and then 3D print. So, what can you do with these 3D printed keys? As we said before, there's these, these three main attacks, teleduplication and bump keys and privilege escalation. Uh, but what have people been doing with 3D printed keys in practice? Well, there's a number of, of people that have, have printed keys. We're not the only ones that do this, and we're not even the first people uh, to have publicly done this. Um, in 2013, there was a, a couple of MIT students at DEF CON that printed a, a Slage Primus key, which is a, a moderately high security key that has actually two sort of cut um, uh, uh, shear lines on it that um, they, they replicated uh, using uh, OpenSCAD, actually, and, uh, and, and, and published this code so that other people could make uh, Slage Primus keys as well. That was, again, a custom modeling of, of just that one keyway. And they printed it using iMaterialize, which after this, this all went public, iMaterialize released this statement that said that it, that it did not support 3D printing of high security keys. In particular, they said that iMaterialize rejects any use of its services to promote activities or to create products which pose a safety or security risk to others. Had they known at the time, they would not have printed these keys. Which is funny, given that if you look at iMaterialize's uh, website right now under their platinum, or sorry, their titanium page, they actually use this image as on their marketing page to show you what you can print uh, with, with their service. So. Uh, more recently, there was uh, this picture published of the TSA master keys in some article. Uh, for some reason, I guess the reporter or whoever was being interviewed thought it would be cool to flash some keys. Um, and this picture was published and then later taken down, but it's the internet, so it's you know, floating around, and here it is here, so um, there's that. Um, this, uh, this does allow you to, you know, it's high enough resolution that you can actually figure out the cuts of each of these keys. And someone did this and actually modeled all of the keys and, uh, and, and modeled this and published this. Now, I will note that TSA master key, it sounds pretty bad, but at the end of the day, the TSA locks were probably not that high security to begin with. Um, there were probably ways around them already. You could probably pick them in a matter of seconds or just bypass the lock entirely by opening the zipper with a Bic pen or something. But nonetheless, it's an interesting uh, sort of experiment and, and, and lesson in when not to show your keys on camera. And finally, uh, the most recent uh, study here is uh, a tool called Photobump, which is very similar to ours, uh, which from a, a single image is able to produce bump keys of, of, uh, that can be printed in plastic. And uh, this was done uh, late last year, and the tool was never actually published. It was just talked about at LockCon, I believe, and I don't think they've released any of the code or anything open source. Uh, but nonetheless, a, a very cool tool that could make bump keys that, that worked on some of these pretty high security locks that were fairly difficult to bump, uh, even with metal keys, but uh, sufficient to work with, with plastic. So <laughs> how can we defend against these attacks? Uh, besides just shoving super glue in our locks and giving up. Uh, I think there's a number of, of different directions that we can go in uh, with this um, 
with, with uh, trying to defend against 3D printed attacks. Uh, one is to look at non-mechanical locks. So electronic locks are, are sort of growing in popularity these days. Now, naturally, that does bring in other kinds of vulnerabilities, and you know, now you have uh, now you have other problems to worry about, like uh, replay attacks or or any kind of software vulnerabilities that might exist in whatever protocols you're using. Uh, but this this will uh, scale pretty well, and it, and it won't have the problem that a lot of the mechanical locks will have uh, when it comes to 3D printing attacks. Uh, sort of slightly related, but a little bit more on the mechanical side of things, there are a number of high security keys that use active keys and keyways to authenticate that the right key is in the lock. Uh, so in addition to, say, having very high tolerances and, and pin tumblers and things like that, uh, this, these keys, like the multi-lock, can have uh, actual spring components in the key that sort of you know, fold in and then come back out at different parts in the insertion process. Uh, and this might be difficult to uh, replicate with 3D printing, given that most, most of 3D printing at this scale right now is limited to entirely solid fills and can't have these very intricate, fine features in them. And finally, uh, I think magnetic locks are kind of an interesting sort of cool gadget. Uh, the EVA MCS is, is an example of this. Uh, this has magnetic pucks inside of it that actually rotate uh, physical, uh, mechanical things inside the lock uh, that have to line up in order for the lock to open. Uh, this would, again, be a little bit tricky to replicate with, with 3D printing alone, although you might be able to do some kind of inlay thing where you put uh, magnetic things uh, and, and be able to copy a key remotely. Uh, if you had, say, you know, a 3D printer and a good compass or something. But, uh, I think one interesting idea that I haven't really seen proposed for, for uh, defending against 3D printing is trap keyways. So trap keyways are a pretty unknown sort of thing in the lock world, but uh, they can be used to uh, essentially trap a key uh, in the lock when it's inserted. So if you have someone, say a contractor or something, that goes away and, and takes their key with them or something, and you don't want them to come back at some point and be able to access uh, whatever uh, door that they, they used to have access to, you can install a different keyway that's essentially configured to trap that key when it's inserted and turned in the lock. And if, if that happens, you won't be able to pull the, lock, or the key out of the lock, and the, the lock will actually have to be drilled. But nonetheless, the person will be stopped from, from entering that, uh, that facility. Uh, and this is useful for, for unauthorizing old keys like that, but it could also prevent privilege escalation and other attacks that are enabled by 3D printing just by um, being able to uh, trap all of the different sort of iterations of the blaze attack that, that might happen during that process. So looking forward into the future, uh, I think there's a, it's a pretty exciting time for 3D printing and locks. Um, we're really just starting to be able to make these keys that are viable in practice. And 3D printing is only getting better. It's only getting higher resolution and cheaper and, and more ubiquitous. And there's more materials every day. I think uh, recently I saw that you can now 3D print in wood, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, but all of this sort of improvement of technology is, is happening on the 3D printing side. I don't see an analog happening in the lock innovation. And, and to be fair, locks are fairly old and, and, and have you know, done fairly well in, in, in recent years and, and, and in history uh, for the most part. But uh, I am a little bit concerned because uh, locks sort of have this intrinsic property that they're limited in sort of how small they can get because the humans that operate them aren't getting any smaller. So uh, on the other hand, the 3D printing tools that we have are able to get smaller and smaller. And so at some point, I think we'll be able to do more of these active keyway attacks and things like that with 3D printing. And moving even beyond that, I think that there's a lot of room for looking at uh, uh, different ways that 3D printed uh, materials could actually actively interact with the pins in the lock. Maybe you could actually make a lock picking device that actually did single pin picking inside of the device uh, using just something that was manufactured on a 3D printer. That's probably a, a ways out, but I think that that, that sort of you know, combination of 3D printing and MEMS-like devices uh, would, would be a really interesting uh, future for the combination of 3D printing and locks. So with that, uh, I'll wrap up and be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks.
Well, thank you for this interesting talk, Eric. I'm fairly sure that this was the magic moment for all the lock pickers present and the highlight of their Congress. So if you have any questions, please move to one of the microphones we have here in the room. Um, I was told that we are only using the four microphones that are down here with the numbers one, two, three, and four. If you have questions, please move to the mics. Even the internet is not awake yet. We don't have any questions from the internet. All right. But we have a question at microphone number one. Please ask your question. Um, does the tool include taking a picture from a key and then make it, or only um, the key way? So is it able that I can photograph your key from here? Uh, it only does it from the lock, so because uh, it's using the outline of the, the, the keyway. Um, if you were able to take a picture of the end on view of the key, uh, then perhaps you could you know, Photoshop that to make that the darkest part of the image and then use that to upload and maybe you have to mirror it at some point, but um, that would also work. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question from mic number four, please. Yeah, uh, um, thank you for the... Um, American locks are notorious for having bad tolerances. Um, did you try your findings with European locks, for example, with Econ locks, which are pretty much better manufactured than Schlage or some other junk? <laughs> oh. So we did not try it on, on those particular locks. We did try it on a number of different keyways, uh, but uh, the Slage ones that we tried it on were not the you know, SC ones or something like that. They were Everest and, and high security. Uh, they were often SFIX, so uh, small format interchangeable cores, uh, which uh, can be harder to pick because they have the control shear and everything. But um, in general, it's, it's all on the A2 system. So any A2 system uh, key, the 3D printers have enough tolerance and, and resolution to print at that sort of 12.5 mils per, um, per cut. All right, next question for mic number two, please. Okay, um, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, I was noticing that the keyways of the commercial systems seem pretty overcomplicated. Is it possible to actually simplify them by replicating the keys? So is the question, can you, can you print simpler keyways and not the entire, the whole thing? Yeah, right. I mean, it, it, yeah. they have details that don't seem to be necessary. Yeah, um, so the, the short answer is yes, uh, and, and people have discovered this before, especially with Medco, uh, there's this surprising property that there's, that actually a straight line fits through the keyway just fine. So you can just you know, stamp out sheet metal or, or a credit card or something like that. Uh, you don't have to actually replicate um, any of the, the squiggles or anything like that. But on most high security locks, that's not true. Uh, you will have to get at least you know, some corner or something that, that actually comes uh, and the key mark is a great example of that. It has this very wide sort of leg that comes off to the side. Um, but in general, yes, you could make something that's smaller. Uh, in, uh, for 3D printed things, you might not want to because uh, it's stronger if it's thicker in different areas. And, and sometimes that's part of the, the keyway design is to make sort of these, uh, these, these ridges and, and, and runners that make the key stronger. Thank you. All right, thanks. After I bashed it, the internet woke up and decided that it actually does have a question. Yes, thank you. How straight on um, does the, the picture has to be of the, of the key bay? How sensitive is it? Yeah, um, I don't know exactly how many degrees, but it's not too sensitive uh, as far as sort of, you know, you can just walk up. You don't have to stand there with a protractor or anything or any kind of guide. Um, it's a little bit tolerant because it will actually make a key slightly smaller uh, for tolerance reasons to fit in the lock. So you have some uh, leeway there to sort of if you're at, if you're at some skew or something like that. Uh, but in general, uh, you know, just taking it straight on um, and eyeballing it, it seems to be good enough. Thank you. Next question from Mike number three. Uh, yeah. Did you notice that any lock manufacturer is for traditional mechanical locks, so no active components, trying to do something to prevent 3D printing of keys? I haven't seen anything concrete from the manufacturers. I know they have mentioned um, that they're aware of these attacks, that they're interested in, in looking into defenses, but I haven't seen anyone that made any uh, specific changes to their locks yet. But uh, given that it probably takes some time to actually you know, make these changes in practice, uh, I don't really fault them for you know, not coming out right away. But nonetheless, these, these printed, 3D printed keys have sort of been a long time coming, I think, uh, in the last few years. Um, and they're just getting more popular. So I think it would be kind of foolish for, for manufacturers to ignore that, uh, but I haven't seen anything yet. All right, I see someone at mic number seven. I'm not 100% sure it's open, but you can try. All right. 
Uh, have you tried to make a negative form and fill this up with some kind of resin with carbon or fiber in it? Are you so uh, make a 3D printing of the negative form and then build the key as the positive while filling up with some fluids? Yeah, so uh, that's actually how the metal uh, 3D printed keys are manufactured by the service that, that makes them. Uh, brass is done with essentially a lost wax casting where the wax is printed, a plaster mold is put around it, and then melted uh, the wax melted out and then molten brass poured in. Uh, stainless steel is, is printed in a, in a slightly different process with uh, uh, you have this sort of centered uh, stainless steel and glue resin that you print the positive of, and they say it has the consistency and, and, and structural integrity of a, of a sand castle um, at that point, that they then put in an oven and uh, fill the rest with bronze, uh, which then replaces the glue, glue so that you have an all-metal um, uh, key at the end, or object, or whatever you're printing um, at the end of that process. Um, we haven't tried doing you know, that ourselves, but that's certainly what the, the, the services are doing for some of the more complicated materials. And it seems to work quite well. Brass has a really high resolution. Uh, as you can see here, this is a 3D printed brass key, uh, and the replication prohibited is part of the 3D model uh, and, and shows up when you print this. All right, we have another question from the internet. Thank you. I have um, two brief questions. Um, first one is, um, have you also looked at rotating disk cylinder locks, and have you ever used ABS as material? Uh, I printed a key on an ABS commercial machine, um, and it was, I believe, not as strong as the PLA, but it was sort of comparable um, as far as, as that goes. It was, it was still op able to open many of the locks. Um, and what was the, the first question? Have you ever looked at rotating disk cylinder locks? Oh, detaining disk cylinder. Uh, no, I haven't looked at that specifically for 3D printing. Uh, I think a lot of these would extend to that, um, but there's probably different tolerances um, in sort of the Z direction that you can get for uh, some of these printers. Uh, part of the tricks here can be sometimes to uh, figure out what angle or what orientation you want to print the key on, uh, because some of these printers will have better resolution in the XY direction than the Z direction, or vice versa. Um, so you have to sort of play around and, and find what the, what the actual tolerance is there. But I haven't, I haven't personally played around with that kind of lock. Another question from Mike number four. Ask away. OK. Um, you've, been try you've been testing a few locks, right? So uh, do you think that in the future we'll, we'll see more like locks that with hardening steel or that have challenge response uh, authentication systems? Because from an emergency services point of view, it's quite important to be able to just drill them open. Yeah. Um, I mean, a, a, a huge important part of, 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 of locks is that they have to always work, right? If you, you know, run out of a battery or something like that, uh, then that's a problem. Uh, a lot of electronic locks have solved that by having the key provide the battery so that you know you know you now have a, a battery that's external and you can replace that. Um, but still that's kind of finicky because maybe your battery runs out, you don't have an extra one and so forth. Um, I think that uh, it's likely in the short term that people will go more toward the active keyways for at least the high security locks. Uh, it's still expensive to do that. It's expensive to manufacture that and expensive to make in practice. Um, so it, it will probably be reserved only for the high security locks. And most of the home locks will sort of have the same, uh, same problems that they always did. Uh, it will be interesting to see which institutions adopt these higher security locks. If universities, say, for example, that traditionally heavily used, say, master keyed systems, um, will move toward higher security locks or move completely away from master keyed systems to avoid some of these, these problems. But I, I don't know have, uh, w what will happen in the future. Okay. Another question from the internet. Is it possible to use a metallic core and print the key around it? Sorry, what, can you repeat? To use a metallic core and print a plastic key around this uh, core? a metallic core and a plastic key around the core. Um, it would be difficult to do that. Uh, it is, so I have seen people on 3D printers sort of print some base layer of plastic, then print, uh, then, then place something else, say even a, a PCB or some kind of electronic or a battery or something or a magnet even, um, and then print the rest of the, the PLA or, or ABS on top of that. Um, I don't know that you would be able to do that with the thickness of these keys. Uh, they're, they're fairly thin. I mean, the, the actual, especially with all of the keyways, uh, sort of wiggles and, and 
um, and so forth, it, it's kind of hard to get an actual very thick part that you could put something metal in. Uh, one thing that you can do, however, is you can sort of leave out a gap in the back of the key and then insert a tension wrench there instead. And so now you have you know, all the strength of a tension wrench, and the, the plastic key is just uh, operating the, the pin tumblers and, and raising them to the right height. All right, the brave person waiting for quite some time at mic number eight. <laughs> Um, how do you actually get the dimensions of the key from the picture? Yeah, so um, in the tool that we use, uh, the dimensions are uh, assumed to be in sort of a standard uh, small format interchangeable core. So uh, from that, most of those are standardized to a specific height. So you can just sort of take the top to the bottom and you know what that height is. Uh, for more complicated locks, you might uh, uh, try, and, and something that we tried to do uh, early on, was detect the circle around the lock out of the mortise. And then if you knew how big that was, either by measure, measuring it or entering it in or, or knowing you know, the, the standard uh, sizes of mortises, then you would be able to scale the image based off of that. All right, Mac number four, please. Um, I'm quite excited. I haven't been thinking that line, um, that it's possible to do that with a 3D printer. I'm, I want to look from a different angle, like the one who wants to protect himself against any threat with uh, reasonable means financially. What would you do in my case? Uh, I think you'd have to define reasonable you know, financial means, but... Uh, you know, if you're if you're running a, a master keyed system, then I think you would probably want to uh, either upgrade to a higher security lock or a different kind of master keyed system. Uh, I know a, a, male, a Yale has a, a I think biaxial uh, lock that has actually two different keyways: one that op uh, one that's uh, for the master key and one that's for the change key. And so then these privilege escalation attacks uh, are not a problem for that kind of. Uh, system. I don't know the relative cost of that offhand, but I know that MIT has moved to those locks uh, almost exclusively. I guess they maybe had a problem with students <laughs> doing privilege escalation or something like that. Um, uh, but I, I don't know many other universities that have done that uh, in recent years. Uh, I think that's a good compromise for that particular attack. But again, it depends on your threat model, right? If you're concerned about people copying your keys, then maybe you want to go with something that's just restricted and, and say, uh, has active components to it, like a multi-lock or something like that. Um, uh, or if you're concerned about bumping or picking, then you can find bump-resistant uh, locks or something like that um, as well. So, um, hey. May yeah. I add one more question? Um, I've seen some people using number locks. On that. This is all uh, not so good, or...? So number pads, I mean, they're, they're kind of an electronic lock, right? It's, uh, it has many of the problems, uh, but it has a limited interface, so it's a little bit better than, say, something that's you know, talking to your smartphone or something like that, um, as far as the attack surface goes. Uh, but it still has the problems of, you know, if it runs out of a battery, there's no backup or something like that, it can be difficult to, to get in, um, and reliability problems there. Uh, and can also be hard to weatherproof them in, in some locations. And uh, number pads in particular have this problem that if you only ever enter correct combinations on the number pad, the correct buttons wear down more than the incorrect ones. And so you, you know, have this side channel for learning um, what the correct combination is. So. All right, the internet is curious and has many questions this morning. Ask yes, away. yes, it has. Um, uh, have you looked at ceramic or epoxy-like materials for keys? Sorry. Can you... Ceramic or epoxy-like materials for uh, keys? I have not. I don't know that you can print in epoxy, um, but maybe you could do some kind of you know, mold-based uh, thing uh, and, and use that instead. Uh, PLA, I think, was fairly good in part because it has this sort of sweet spot between being flexible and, and rigid. Um, nylon was, was way too flexible and just sort of bent like a rubber, rubber band inside the lock. Uh, and acrylic was way too uh, brittle and, and sort of didn't have any give to it and just snapped off. So um, finding that sweet spot is, I think, pretty important. All right, any other questions? You have another 10 to 15 minutes to ask the hell out yeah. of the speaker <laughs> now that he's here and you can get your hands on him. So any other questions? It does not seem to be the case, and even the internet is satisfied, at least for now. So please give another warm round of applause to our speaker, Eric. Thank you. Thank you.